In this video, we will start our discussion about coroutines in C++20 standards. Coroutines are complex but revolutionary step towards more elegant pseudo-asynchronous programming in C++. At the time of making this video, only a few compilers have a standard coroutine support, so please visit the compiler support for C++20 web page and check whether your compiler supports the coroutines. I'm going to use GCC 10.2 with Compiler Explorer to demonstrate the coroutine-related programs. So let's go to the Compiler Explorer and then select the GCC compiler. To use coroutines, you have to specify C++ 2A, E, or 20 and dash f coroutine flag as compiler arguments to indicate to compiler to use C++ 20 standards when compiling. And also, we have to specify that we need coroutine-related code generation, and finally, to generate the function in the code as non-exempt code because coroutine expects some functions to be non-exception throwing functions, and that's why this is no exception flag. So let's learn about coroutines step by step within this environment. There are two types of routines, subroutines and coroutines. So let's first look at how subroutines work. What are subroutines? Subroutine is another name for function. For example, here we have a main function and within main function, we call the foo function. To understand a coroutine, it is important to understand what happened underneath when executing a function or subroutine. So when execution come to main function in the stack, it means we already have stack frame correspond to this main function. Here, you can see the simplified version of the stack frame. It contains argument of the function and also local variables of the function. When main function calls the foo function, what happened is that this function call will add another stack frame on top of the main stack frame, which contained arguments of the foo function and local variables of the foo function. At this point, foo function's stack frame is at the top of the execution stack. Once we go out of the scope from foo function, the stack frame correspond to foo function will be popped from the execution stack. At this point, there's no trace about the foo function. This is how usual function call works. Then, when main function goes out of the scope, the stack frame corresponds to the main function will be popped from running the stack as well. So from the caller function, in this case, main function, if we call foo function, then we have to wait until foo function returns. So from the main function point of view, execution is block at the foo function call until full function's execution finished. With normal function calls, there are two main stages. Invoke stage, which initialized the function call, and finalize stage, where resource deallocation happens. When caller invoke function, then caller has to wait until the call finish its execution. So until then, caller will be in blocked state. But with coroutines, there will be two new operations. Coroutines can suspend its execution, and later, caller, or whomever has the handle of coroutine has the ability to resume the coroutine's execution. Let me show you a sample coroutine code and explain it in a bit more detail. Consider this code segment. Notice the coAwait operator inside the foo function. When compiler sees that foo function contains the coAwait operator, it will consider this function as a coroutine. Not only coAwait operator, if function contains either coAwait, coYield, or coReturn, compiler will consider that function as a coroutine. coAwait is a unary operator which takes a waitable object. We will see these in detail in the upcoming videos. But for now, remember this coAwait operator together with its argument, which in this case 
must return from the suspend always function call will make this coroutine pause its execution. And in the main function, notice we have return value from the coroutine. What we do in the main function is seems like function call, but it is not a mere function call. In fact, what we do here is that we construct the coroutine object. That's all. Let me show you what this means. So if I ran this example, there's no output printed, but in foo coroutine, we suspend the function after print out a to the console. But when we run this example, there are no outputs because when coroutine is constructed, it will be in initial suspended state. User has to explicitly resume execution in order to initiate the coroutine execution in first place. I can do that by calling resume function on return object of the coroutine construction. So if I run this example now, you can see in the output it only printed out a letter to the console and nothing more because it's in suspend state due to this line of code. Notice this resume function is user defined function and we will see how to provide user implementation in my next video. Now let's look at the runtime stack for this coroutine calls. So in the slide on your left, you can see the stack for normal function call, but with this type of stack, we cannot force the execution call function without blocking the caller. To handle this for coroutines, we will construct coroutine object in heap memory. And when execution resumes from the caller, then using that coroutine state object, we create a stack frame and copy to the caller stack. Then that stack frame will be executed. When coroutine suspends, it will update the state object in heap using the values updated in the executed stack frame and pop the temporary static frame from the caller stack. But we can again resume the execution of coroutine as we have restored the states in the heap. Notice coroutines stack less, meaning it does not initiate any stack for itself, but it will copy that stack frame to running stack as I mentioned earlier. This is a performance boost since there is no context switching required. Okay. Let's see another example of where we can utilize the coroutines. Consider this example. Here, we have a function call get numbers which return a vector of integers ranging from the start to the end. Then, in the main function, I can retrieve the vector which has values between 10 to 30. And then, let's print out the values. Here, I'm going to print out first 10 elements in a loop and then next 10 elements in another for loop. This is very naive implementation, but humor me because it will give you an idea about usage of coroutines. Now notice the get number function call from the main will always get the fully populated vector, but in the first loop, we can only utilize first 10 or first part of the vector. With the coroutine, we can have get number function, which will generate a number based on request from the operation. For example, here we have another function called get number lazy, because we usually refer this type of on request operation as lazy operations. If we use this coroutine, then the number generation will happen on request from the main function or caller code. So at the end of the first for loop, our vector will have only 10 elements because of this lazy initialization. Next 10 elements of the vector will be generated when second for loop is executing. This type of lazy generators are one of the main usages of coroutines.